Greetings, listeners. On today's episode of Radio Astronomy, I'm talking to Luciano Rizzola, an astrophysicist from the Institute of Theoretical Physics at Gotha University in Frankfurt, who has spent his career researching relativity, gravity, and the effect of both of these on some of the universe's most mysterious inhabitants, black holes. He has recorded humanity's long history to understand these objects in his new book due out in March called The Irresistible Attraction of Gravity. Now, Luciano, that's a very evocative name, the irresistible attraction. And what is it about black holes that you particularly find so irresistibly attractive? Right. So, um, well, first of all, we we all know that um, gravity attracts. um, We know it attracts as a physical interaction. You know, things tend to fall on the ground rather than leaving it. Uh, But the title wants to underline the fact that gravity also has an attraction on our minds, on our imagination. Um, It's a matter of of fascination for us to try and understand this very basic force. In fact, this is the only force out of the four forces in nature of which we have a, a direct conscious experience. You know, other forces like the electromagnetic or the weak uh, or the strong forces, they, they, they certainly act on us. They allow us to be what we are, but we are not aware of them, right? We don't really know or measure every day what is the, the force that is keeping the molecules together or our atoms together. We just know we are here. On the other hand, we have a physical um, feeling, a feeling, f- physical experience with gravity because Wherever we are, whether we are standing or sitting, there is something that is acting on us as a force. And so it's this attraction and, and this very special interaction that we have with gravity that is one of the, of the main motives behind this book. And actually, I, I even go as far as saying that we have um, a prenatal experience with gravity and we know about gravity well before we are born. Um, and to support this uh, rather bizarre conjecture, I use an evidence, which is the Moro reflex. The Moro reflex is a, a test, a, a um, physiological test that is applied to newborn babies, really just a few seconds born babies, uh, to check that the whole you know, nervous system works all right. And what you actually do is you, you take the newborn baby, uh, you hold it, and then you subject it to um, like a free fall, or the, 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 uh, you simulate a free fall. And, and what you realize in doing so, of course, you always keep this baby very carefully, but what you realize is that as a reaction to this, the baby opens up the arms and tries to clench to something. So this is telling you that, you know, when we are completely unaware of the world around us, we are completely uh, hopeless and harmless, we nevertheless able to you know, react to gravity, to the acceleration of gravity. And that's because we actually have experience in our mother's wombs for, for nine months or so. So I think, you know, gravity has a, we have an, a, a, an interaction with gravity, which is far deeper than, um, than we think. And this brings then us to why we find concepts like black holes so fascinating, because, well, black holes are the champions of gravity. They are the most extreme manifestation of, of, of this force. And they come up with a number of very bizarre behaviors. And from you know, a theoretical physics point of view, also a lot of headaches on, on, on some of the consequences about their existence. Mm. And black holes, are, we've, we've known about them for, for several decades now. Why are they so difficult to study? And why do we still know relatively little about them? We actually know about these solutions uh, already a few months after Einstein's theory of gravity was suggested. Uh, Karl Schwarzschild, who actually was from Frankfurt, came up with a solution uh, that is called the Schwarzschild solution that actually now we know represents a a non-rotating black hole. But for many years, uh, people did not understand what this solution was all about and actually thought it was just, you know, a mathematical 
uh, bizarre manifestation of this equation that had very little to to do with reality, in particular with astrophysics, because it was predicting an object that, that was really behaving strange, like an object where light could stop, where time would slow down, and, and all of these very bizarre phenomena. And it was just in the 60s when um, we started to do you know, observations in the X-ray band that we realized there were objects that simply could not be explained with, with stellar theory, with the idea that you have these large stars um, that, that have, you know, like, like the sun or even more massive. The idea that we have objects that are extremely compact and yet produce humongous amounts of radiation, that's something that could not be explained with the understanding we had of stellar theory at that time. And so at that point, people started to think, okay, wait a second, there are, there are these bizarre solutions that predicted, uh, were predicted by Einstein's relativity. Um, what if this is what we're looking at here? And that's you know, why the idea of black hole all of a sudden gained interest again in the 60s and then later on in the 70s when all of these beautiful studies were done about uh, black holes. Now, the reason why they are so hard to observe is because by definition, they are the most compact object you can produce. You take an object of a given mass and if you squeeze it in a volume which is sufficiently small, at one point, you will reach a volume so small that you will have to, to produce a black hole. Just to give you an example, suppose that we take the sun and we compress it without losing any single atom in it. We just compress it. Well, if you compress it and compress it up to a radius of about three kilometers, then out of the sun, you will produce a black hole. And the same can be said of the Earth. If you compress it and compress it down to a, a diameter of a few centimeters, you will have produced a black hole. So producing black hole is all about concentrating in a very small region of space a lot of mass. And because they are intrinsically compact, they are very small, and normally they are very large distances. So it's, you know, from an astronomical point of view, the projected size on the sky is extremely small. That's why it is so hard to see them. Besides, by definition, they cannot produce light. So it's, they are elusive also from this point of view. And because, as you said, black holes are black. They don't produce light. And, you know, one of the things that most people, the first things you learn about black holes is they're so dense that not even light can escape them. So how can we see these black holes? What is it actually we're, we're looking at them when people are observing them? Right. So what we actually see is the light that is produced by whatever material is around them that is actually falling onto them. As the material is falling onto it, onto a black hole, it will become denser but simply because uh, it will be confined to a smaller and smaller region, will become hotter or more energetic and will start shining. And so the light we see is the light of the material, which is outside of the black hole, maybe even very close to the black hole, but manages not to, to, to be emitted before entering into the black hole. And that's what we see, for instance, in the images of these supermassive black holes that the Event Horizon Telescope has uh, recently produced in 2019 and more recently last year in 2022. What we're seeing, you know, in this funny looking donuts shaped object, orange uh, objects, well, this is the light of an accretion disk, a disk of plasma that is rotating around a black hole and is slowly being accreted. And before it actually enters the black hole, it's emitting light, and that's the light we can actually see. So we don't have any a direct evidence of the light coming from a, a black hole because a black hole intrinsically cannot emit light. But the light that is emitted near it has very precise signatures, and from this signature, we understand that there is a black hole. Mm. And you mentioned the, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which is, I know, a project that you were involved with. How, how were you involved with that project? So I am one of the, you know, the first founders of this project back in, in 2014. And um, my job within the collaboration is that of the theorist. So... The Event Horizon Telescope is, is a fantastic collaboration which requires a lot of expertise. You need to have people who are able to 
perform the actual radioastronomical observation, then you need people who are able to convert these observations, these radio waves into images, and then you need people who are able to interpret and obtain measurements of the properties of, of the image. And I am in this last part of this production chain. Um, once the data is collected and, and calibrated, an image is produced, and then at the end of the day, it is given passed over to people like me and my colleagues with theories who try to make sense of it and, and try to measure whether this is a black hole or not, but it matches our expectations and what are the measurements that we can derive out of this image. And I suppose we should mention that um, what actually is, is the Event Horizon Telescope? How does it work? All right, so the, the Event Horizon Telescope is not a telescope. <laughs> it's <laughs> a collection of telescopes. Now, again, because they are so small in on the sky, the only way to see a black hole of that size is by using a telescope, a radio telescope. And I'll explain why you need radio waves and not something else. You need a radio telescope which has sufficient resolution. And when you work out what is the size of this telescope, then you realize that the size of this telescope is of the order of a few thousand kilometers. Now, it's difficult to produce a, a radio telescope of that size. But what you can do is you can use a very smart technique that was developed already in the 70s and it's called radio interferometry. Essentially, you you create a virtual telescope which is as large as the distance between two small telescopes if you were ab- if you are able to put them into an a interferometric pattern in other words you just take two telescopes radio telescopes say one in France and one uh, um, in um, Chile and you ask these two telescopes to take uh, the same data the same to make the same observations and you collect the data from these two telescopes and then you put it together and obtain an image as if it was seen by a single telescope as large as the distance between France and Chile. Now if you think a little bit about this you may start wonder if there isn't something fishy about all this right because how can this possibly work? Well there is a trick Um, And the trick is that you really have to make sure you are observing exactly the same wave front, the same electromagnetic wave as it reaches us. And how do you do this? Well, you measure at the same time the intensity of of the electric field. That's what a standard radio telescope does. But at the same time, you have to record the time when you are receiving this electric field. And that's why any of these telescopes has to be be, uh, using a very sophisticated, very precise atomic clocks so that they can record not only the intensity of the electric field, but also the time of the arrival of the, of the, of the electric field. And in this way, that you can really do interferometry. It's in, only in this way that you can be sure that you really have a, a single virtual telescope. And then you reach these fantastic resolutions of tens of micro arc seconds. And you were, as you said, you were involved with the the sort of theory side of this. So after the image has been taken and um, it, it's been processed together, what? How do you sort of start using that image for for science and sort of taking that forward? So actually, well before the the, the image was produced, we we were in charge of of um, addressing the problem of how would a black hole look like. Um, and so what we did was we performed a number of simulations. About half of the, the simulations that were performed were, were performed here in, in, uh, in Frankfurt. And in these simulations, you essentially try to solve uh, two problems at the same time. The first one, you try to understand what happens to matter that is falling onto a black hole. In other words, imagine you take a bucket of water uh, and you throw it onto a black hole. What does what is the dynamics of this water? How does it move? Effectively, we don't throw water; we use you know plasma, and um, we have to be careful that the plasma is endowed with strong magnetic fields, and that's why we do simulations of accretion onto black holes using magneto hydrodynamics. In this way, we learn you know how. Um, 
the density, the temperature, the magnetic field is uh, organized when material falls onto a black hole. And we learned, for instance, that very naturally you tend to produce a jet, an outflow uh, of material where there is a very strong magnetic field, very little matter, and this normally happens in the polar direction of the black hole. However, that's just part of of the problem because what we learn in this way is what happens to matter. But what we actually have to understand is what happens to light because this matter is also um, producing light. And how does this light then reach us is a very complicated business in, in, in general relativity because light can do very bizarre turns in a curved space-time, that is a space-time here, a black hole. Just to give you an idea, um, we are looking at each other now through a screen and all I have to do is point my eyes towards the screen because there is light moving on a straight line from the screen over to my eyes. But if we were in a curved space-time, you may be behind me and light be, may be bent in such a way that Actually, although you are behind me, you, your, your light actually reaches me. And so that's what we have to do um, together with these magnetoaerodynamic simulations. We have to calculate how does light emitted by this plasma and doing all these bizarre trajectories then actually reaches us. And um, in this way, we can have a realistic view of what is the emission from these objects. And so we have done this for many different conditions because we don't really know what are the physical conditions near black hole. And we had to explore a number of different scenarios where, you know, which differed by the properties of the black hole or the properties of the plasma and so on. And uh, I know that in uh, 2019, we had the first image of uh, a supermassive black hole at the heart of M87, and also last year, the image of our, our own Milky Way's black hole. What science has, has come from those images and sort of what have been the, the latest discoveries that have been made? First of all, we have evidence that in both M87 and in, in our Milky Way, there is an object at the centre that looks and behaves like a black hole. This is... Um, a very important result in astronomy, maybe something that everybody expected, but you know, now we have an evidence, an experimental observational evidence that this idea that at the center of a galaxy there is a supermassive black hole has been shown, at least in two cases. Then you, you know, we can extrapolate this to the billions of galaxies in the universe, but at least for those two we have seen is exactly like that. And we also have shown that, you know, this object um, that we, that is at the center of, the, of a galaxy uh, has all the features and fits perfectly with the predictions of general relativity. So once again, is the possibility of having a direct connection with these very bizarre objects that are um, predicted by general relativity and that so far could not really be nailed down in any convincing manner. If you want, you, you can look at it also in another way. Um, it, you know, I am a scientist and all of what I do is based on a principle or a method that was developed uh, many years ago by Galileo Galilei, and that's a scientific method, which is not applied only to astronomy, of course, but to any scientific uh, knowledge in, in our times. And the idea is I have a theory I or I have... Um, to explain some phenomenon, some physical experiment or some physical phenomenon. And then I use an experiment to prove or disprove whether my theory, my explanation is correct. In the case of black holes, this has been very difficult to do because we didn't have an experiment. We cannot produce black holes on Earth, luckily. So all we have is, you know, observations. And these observations were lacking so far. So with these observations, we have in a way, transformed a concept, that of the black hole, of the event horizon, into a testable object. It's a very basic first step of the scientific method. And that, to me, is the most valuable contribution of the event horizon telescope. We have transformed the event horizon, something I write on the blackboard when I teach general relativity, over to a testable concept. 
And that makes a huge difference. And is the Event Horizon Telescope, the, the observation part of it anyway, I know the data is going to be analysed for, for years to come, but is the actual observational part of it now over or will there be a, another run or something in the future? Actually, we're far from being having the optimal um, resolution. There are many things which can improve. First of all, you know, you've seen that our images, they're pretty fuzzy and uh, that's because the resolution, although it's the best possible and we made a huge jump with whatever done in the past, uh, is still, you know, not good enough for answering some of the questions I personally would like to answer is really, uh, there's a black hole or, because there's still a lot of uh, wiggle room for other interpretations. Can we uh, really be certain disease a black hole uh, as Einstein predicted. So in order to answer this question, we need better and better um, observations. That is what we are carrying out. The Einstein telescope, as I said, doesn't have a telescope. As to ask for time to all of the different telescopes which are involved, and this is a process we normally undertake by applying for observation time, which we normally receive in the spring. And uh, we keep asking this time and we keep doing observations. So we have uh, we have made observation in 2018, in 2021, in 22. And, um, and we hope that these observations will improve and we actually already know that in some cases that is so, the quality of our, of our images. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's going to be a long way uh, to be able to answer the questions I was mentioning before. But it's something something that we are doing actively right now. And obviously, now that we've, we've taken these images, we've done these observations, um, but what is, why is it so important to, to understand black holes and, and do these kinds of experiments? What can they teach us about, about the universe? Some of the predictions of this theory are so bizarre and so extreme that confirming that would really improve enormously our understanding of physics. So obviously, you know, knowing more about black holes will not change our lives. Uh, we, we will still have to pay the same bills. But it does address some very important questions about the inner workings of, um, of general activity. You know, just think about this. General activity is predicting that there are regions in the universe all those underneath the event horizon, which are not probable by, in the sense they cannot be probed by any experiment. Because, well, simply because, not because the laws of nature are broken, but because whatever happens inside a black hole remains inside a black hole. There is no way for us to find out, at least, you know, without resorting to quantum mechanics and the possible evaporation. So in my book, there is a, a dialogue that underlines the frustration a person like me has on this uh, topic. And, the, and so I am creating this virtual dialogue between two observers which are, who are outside a black hole, a supermassive black hole. They are on a safe, uh, stable orbit, so they are not running any risk about uh, being absorbed by the black hole. And, and one of them... Um, Ask the other. So, do you know what's inside a black hole? And the and, and and the other one answers, yes, of course, I know what is inside a black hole. I can explain anything that will happen inside a black hole to a very uh, precise accuracy up until you reach this very center. There, you know, my 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 laws break out because there is a singularity. But up until there, I can tell you everything. And anyone says. No, 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 I don't think so. Actually, I think inside a black hole, um, black holes are famous for hosting the most delicious ice creams. And in particular, they have all of the flavors that I like most. And the first person is very frustrated by this statement because he knows that this is wrong, but there is nothing he can do to prove that, it is, uh, that the other person is wrong. Because even though they could both go there inside a black hole, and show that there is no ice cream shop. They actually cannot tell anybody. So there are, you know, it, it, these aspects of, 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 are really very deeply rooted in what we understand with knowledge and the ability of performing experiments 
and getting to find out about the laws of nature. That is why it is so important to, to study these objects. And as you mentioned there in your book, uh, The Irresistible Attraction of Gravity, a journey to discover black holes. It's, it's a very big topic. So what, what does the book cover and, and how do you make it you know, accessible to, to some of our listeners at home? It's difficult to, to make a book which is scientifically correct and yet accessible. So the, the, I've tried my best. And the way I do this is by using analogies. I use a lot of analogies which are derived from, you know, having had three children and, and all of whom have been exposed to the subtleties of general relativity. Um, and so I, I often come up with uh, simple analogies between our daily experience and what happens near a black hole and, and so on and so forth. And I hope that this will break uh, a little bit, um, will allow people to understand complex uh, concepts like space-time curvature that you know often are, are, are bounced around when talking about black holes and yet are not so difficult to understand if put in the right context. It does sound like a fascinating read. Uh, The Irresistible Attraction of Gravity by Luciano Rizzola is available from Cambridge University Press in March. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to talk to us, Luciano. I know I've learnt a lot and um, hopefully some of our listeners have as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. 